Hello. Oh, hey, people in the back can hear me now. I was just saying how. <laughs> thank you. I was just saying how I'm not really going to say anything all that important. Uh, so I like to start my presentations with a little bit of a story that I like to tie back to why I wrote this presentation. Does anyone here have children that you know about? Anyone? Anyone? People are confused. They're like, I don't know how to answer that. Like if I, if I anyway. Uh, so I have three children, uh, nine, four, and, and one and a half, and they're all boys, which makes for a really interesting time when daddy has to watch all three children. And one day, and the date is very important, it was April 2nd. I was watching all three boys, which is usually chaos and involves yelling things that you think about them later on at night, like when you're in bed, you're like, I actually had to yell that today. Like, don't take that rock and draw on the car with it. It's bad. <laughs> so I found myself in one of those situations when on April 2nd, I opened up the cabinet and there was a gallon of milk in the cabinet. And so I yelled one of those ridiculous things. Why is there a gallon of milk in the cabinet? And so my nine-year-old's like, I don't know. You know, mom, she's crazy. <laughs> like, really? So I called my wife. I'm like, uh, sweetie, are you, are you feeling okay? She's like, yeah, why? I'm like, because there's a gallon of milk in the cabinet. Did you put it there? She's like, why would I do that? She's like, do I need to come home? I'm like, no, no, no. Everything's fine. I got it under control. There's just a gallon of milk in the cabinet. It's cool. It's cool. So then I get my kids ready to go into the car to go somewhere. And two hours later, because those with kids understand that, two hours later, we're getting in the car. And I have the one-year-old, and I'm holding him, about to put him in the seat. And I open the door, and again, I yell one of those ridiculous things. Why is there poop in the car? There's poop, poop on, on the seat in the car. And again, my nine-year-old's like, I don't know. It's You know, we have dogs. He's like... It's poop. What? It, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm like, well, this is highly suspect. And I'm like, I, I take it out of the car. It's on this like cardboard, and I like put it in there. And again, I call my wife, and I'm like, I'm like, sweetie, I'm like, did you leave poop in the car? She's like, okay, I'm really no, I'm coming home now. Like, you're done. You're not allowed to watch the kids anymore. I'm coming home. I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. There was just poop in the car. I got it under control. Never mind. Forget I said anything. And then I started to put the pieces together and I have to sit like all three kids down, like one year old, four year old, and nine year old. And I'm like, okay, who fabricated fake poop and who put the milk in the cabinet? And no one would go up to it. The, the four year old's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Can we go play now? And the nine year old's like, I don't know, dad. I really don't know. And the whole time he's kept a complete straight face. And finally, I'm like, okay, here's the deal. I'm turning the Wi-Fi off for the entire house until someone confesses. The four-year-old takes his iPad and starts beating the nine-year-old and goes, will you just confess? Finally, I want Wi-Fi. And so finally, the nine-year-old confesses. The impressive part was he got the milk in the cabinet without anyone noticing. The more impressive part with readily available materials inside of the car, perfectly fab fabricated fake poop. And therefore, that makes him the best hacker and social engineer in the world, in my eye, if I'm somewhat biased, and why I need to go reach out to things like kung fu movies to gain a deeper understanding of security, because I'm going to have to protect myself from my children. Uh, so a little bit about me, uh, some of you may not know, I studied Kung Fu for about 10 years, like actual Kung Fu with like, an actual Kung Fu teacher who used to say things like, that's great, now do it 300 more times and you, you might be better. And then I watched a lot of Kung Fu movies. I have a lot of Kung Fu movies. I've seen a lot of Kung Fu movies. So uh, that's my standard disclaimer, which is funny. I used to say my thoughts don't necessarily convey those uh, or in opinions of my employer and my own employer now. Uh, I do security weekly full time as well as offensive countermeasures. Uh, so my thoughts are, are my own and I guess represent my employer, which is security weekly, which we have a, a bar in the studio. Anyway, um, so I came to the talk because I was sitting there, I was watching kung fu movies and I was like, wow, 
I've seen so many kung fu movies and there are these themes and just things that happen all of the time in these kung fu movies. And I started jotting down notes like, there's really some parallels here to security. And I said, well, they kind of break down in four categories. And there's these different elements in each category. And I'm like, I could, I could do a talk. I'm like, I, I could. And then I'm like, no, nah, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do a talk. And then I'm like, no, no, no I really think you can do a talk. And by the time I had finished, I had a couple of pages worth of notes. And I was like, no, I can totally do a talk. Um, so inside this talk, we're going to talk about four different areas. The student-teacher dynamic, kung fu, uh, security kung fu tactics, political and social, and other interesting facts, which is really just like ridiculous things about kung fu movies that no one should really have to know or ever use in life ever again. But I know a lot of these useless facts that I will share with you, as well as a list of recommendations for kung fu movies to watch, which is kind of like a bonus, right? Okay, so this is episode one. This is the teacher and student dynamic, uh, which I think is a really interesting topic. Now, the game we're going to play today, you're going to help me out with this presentation, because I really want to differentiate between what happens in the kung fu movies and what happens, yeah, I think, in security. So each of these four episodes has different subtopics, and they're all numbered. So when you see one of those slides, you're going to say, in the kung fu movies, what? Okay, you want to try it? Ready? Ready? One, two, three. In the kung fu movies, what? Beautiful. You're awesome. Okay, number one. Your master will be a hermit living in the woods and reluctant to train you. In the Kung Fu movies, there's usually an individual who wants to take revenge for his family dying in some kind of heinous way. So they go out into the woods and they find a master uh, who is reluctant to teach them Kung Fu because their intentions aren't good and they've been burned by previous students and they're just old, uh, drunken lazy masters now, apparently, um, but have really awesome kung fu skills. And they try and hide their kung fu skills from everyone because if everyone knew they had kung fu skills, everyone would ask them to teach them kung fu and they could, just couldn't, didn't want to do that. So uh, for some of those reasons, your hacker mentor might be reluctant to teach you. There is some kind of uh, responsibility associated with teaching someone about hacking because they could use that to do the wrong things and without the same kind of values. Uh, so teaching people how to break into things comes with the same moral responsibility. Fortunately, the people that know some stuff about hacking are at this conference. We're not out living in the middle of the woods drinking wine from, from wooden containers, although it sounds like a good idea sometimes, but we're usually, you know, here at conferences or available via social media or email, making us a few milliseconds away. In fact, my good friend Keith Hoodlet right here created InfoSegMentors.net, well, the most recent iteration of it, uh, along with Jimmy Vo uh, and others who've supported him, uh, which is just an awesome resource. It's like a dating site for InfoSec professionals, right? Isn't that, isn't that? I mean, it's, it's how like Joff and I met, right? <laughs> and he's been such a great mentor ever since. So, <laughs> so, but it legit is like you put on there like what you want to get out of it. Like you like long walks on the beach. You like writing Nmap scripts and you like using Metasploit. And then someone will come up and, and help you learn those things. You don't necessarily have to have the intention of wanting to learn straight security stuff. You could say, hey, I want to learn how to build some stuff and write some software. And maybe someone like Keith who actually knows how to write software can teach me how to do that. And maybe I can teach Keith some hacking things and we have a great time. And then we hold hands and walk on the beach. It's beautiful. So we did an interview with Keith. Or like he's right here, you can just like talk to him and stuff. Um, so InfoSec Mentors, you don't have to trek out into the middle of nowhere and find a master. You can just go to a website. It's awesome. Uh, San Soto has a mentor program. And someone else, uh, I will publish it on my social media when I find it. And I think we're bringing that person on for an interview. There is someone else trying to do some mentor stuff. If anyone's doing mentor stuff or knows of someone doing mentorship programs, let us know. We'll put it on the show. Okay. Um, so there are lots of ways to get in touch with your hacker mentor, right? 
uh, IRC Slack email mailing list. It's not that hard, hard to keep in touch with a mentor. You don't have to go visit them in the woods. Once you've found a mentor, you can communicate with them in all of these great and fantastic ways. Okay, number two. Your master will probably be drunk and punish you for taking shortcuts. And I, I put these, I don't know why these go together so well. Um, but it, in the, the kung fu movies, it's very, very popular. Like every kung fu movie pretty much has to have some kind of training scene where the student is learning from the master. Usually these scenes are pretty ridiculous and they do some really ridiculous things like Jackie Chan is doing horse stance over like a burning incense and he's having hot tea on him so that if he moves the hot tea spills on him. Like there's a lot of ridiculous things like that. And then there was this ridiculous one where he's doing finger push-ups over uh, eggs. And if he breaks the eggs, he doesn't get to eat the eggs. So he has to eat just the rice. And there's this like ridiculous scenes where he's trying to steal the eggs from the master until he gets strong enough. And I watched that movie and I legit like a, a few weeks later, uh, my teacher was showing us Mantis style and was having us do uh, push-ups on our fingers and I really thought he was going to break out the eggs. I was really scared. Um, so, um, but, oh, so what happens in the training is the student will try and shortcut it, right? Like when the master's not looking, What, what, what is that? I Notice how like I, I kept going because I was like, oh, it's just like a kid's toy at home. Like, <laughs> what, what, is, what is that? What is that? <laughs> oh my God, it's hot. Good Lord. Oh, not near my laptop. <laughs> oh, it's like hot. And just like that, it's all gone. Um, so <laughs> I was, I want to say that was refreshing, but it really wasn't. Oh, so just like I did, the students will cheat and try and cheat and think the master's not looking. So rather than doing like 200 push-ups, like you pretend you're still doing push-ups when you're not doing push-ups. And the master always notices, like they pretend they're sleeping, but they know the student's cheating and they'll like throw something and the student will fall. It happens in hundreds of kung fu movies. So, um, where did I put my clicker? Uh, so, the same thing happens in computer security. Now, this isn't necessarily security related, more technology related, but when you're learning VI, if you have a good teacher, they're not having you use the arrow keys. If anyone today, does anyone today use the arrow keys in VI? Because if you do, I have a present for you. Don't do that. That's right. You don't want to move your fingers from the keyboard down to where the arrow keys are. You want them to stay on there. So that's one of the things when I was learning VI, I had someone who was teaching me Linux and, and all the tools, and I started using the arrow keys, and like he legit hit my hand. He, I was like, what is, the, what is that? He was like, don't use the arrow. I'm like, okay, wow. And like similar things happen when you learn martial arts too. Yeah, but yeah, then he's used a skate. Yeah, there's lots of little things you should probably shouldn't do in VI that, yeah, I do too. Uh, so, uh, yeah, sometimes pen tests and vulnerability assessments uh, can give people a false hope if you take shortcuts. When you're doing those kind of assessments as well, it can lead to bad things. Shortcuts are bad. A lot of us do shortcuts or uh, take a shortcut when we're doing security architecture for an organization. And these are three things that... Most often, I find organizations are taking a shortcut on because regardless of what your project should be, you, you got to know these three things. And these are three things that I find that most organizations don't really have a good handle on. You're supposed to know where all of your sensitive data lives and define those different levels of sensitivity for all of your data. You're also supposed to do a complete asset inventory and know where all of your applications are, all of your systems are. 
And then on top of that, you're supposed to know who's responsible for all of those systems and application and who's supposed to have access to all that sensitive data. If you don't have that and you're going out and buying other security products, you're, you're probably in a losing battle. You need to define those things first. And I find that's one of the biggest shortcuts that, excuse me, organizations take today. Okay. Now the drinking part. Um, some of you may recognize some of the people in this photograph. Uh, some of them are extremely famous. Like, like, where's Trent? He didn't, he didn't, he didn't come to my talk. Dick. Um, so, <laughs> uh, that's Jeff Moss right there, right? And that was one of my friends at the time who consumed too many Red Bulls and vodka and had an opportunity to meet with and hang with uh, some really smart people. Well, I mean, aside from Trent, because he didn't come to my talk, but some really smart people in the industry. And he was passed out in a lounge chair at a, at a pool party. So you might want to leave drinking to uh, the masters. Okay. Number three. If the master won't teach you, you can just fight them enough times so that you learn their style, right? This is one of the great contention points in the plots in Kung Fu movies. Not really. The plots mostly suck. Uh, the dialogue mostly sucks. The only good reason why you'd watch it is for the fight scenes. So they said, well, they can just learn Kung Fu by fighting the master and getting their ass kicked. And then they go back and think about how the master kicked their ass and then practice those moves. It's very... Painful, and in Shaolin versus Lamba, he bribes, also bribes the master with a chicken, which is hilarious in and of itself, um, <laughs> uh, to eat the chicken. Because Shaolin, you really, don't make me go there. Uh, Shaolin monks don't, don't eat meat anyway. Um, so <laughs> you can learn security by getting hacked. Those of you that listen to the show know that, hey, when uh, you got started in security, one of the reasons I got started was because I got hacked somehow, right? I mean, it was one of the reasons that intrigued me about it. You can also learn by playing defense or offense at CCDC competitions. Um, getting hacked shows you how not to play defense, right? So there's some exercises. There's some, I mean, like, don't take an unpatched XP system. Hey, this is going to be my computer. And I'm going to get hacked and learn security because that's what Paul said. No, that's not what I'm saying. Not what I'm saying. Uh, you can read about those that have gotten hacked. And this is an older example uh, from Hack Team uh, that produced a very, very nice write-up of how uh, they breached Hack Team. More recently on the IoT side, um, Moses uh, Hernandez, he, he's not, he not, didn't come to my talk, son of a bitch. Um, I think he had to catch a flight. Uh, but uh, anyway, he showed me one from AT&T. There was another one from D-Link that recently broke that basically they took you step by step through exactly what they did to uncover the vulnerabilities and break into the IoT devices. Fantastic examples. Find those examples, read them, acquire the hardware software necessary to reproduce them, and you've got a great way to learn Kung Fu without getting your ass kicked, right? Because you're going to do it in a lab. Uh, I, I don't know if there's, like, a, a, a parallel to this, like, learning Kung Fu, like, to prove the student's worthy, like, sitting in horse stance, like, what would I have you do to prove you're worthy? Like, you have to ping this target for, like, as long as you can. So, uh, the long and the short of this story is this is like an actual way to vet students uh, in China. There were way more students that wanted to learn Kung Fu than one teacher could teach them. So they would post it in the school and say, hey, if you're interested in learning Kung Fu, come to the auditorium at this time. And a hundred people would show up. And the master would come out and he would say, okay, everyone get into horse dance. And then he would walk and go in his office and he would read the paper and he would sip tea and he would come out about a half an hour later and half the people would be gone. And he'd say, still too many. He'd go back in and repeat the same thing until basically there was three or four people left and he would say, show up tomorrow to learn Kung Fu. I don't know if there's an equivalent in, in information security. I just think that's a really cool story uh, and true that they came from my teacher. So, uh, yeah, so Kung Net Wars is pretty, pretty similar. Uh, number four. Uh, Kung Fu masters have friendly battles to test each other's skills. And I, I think this is relevant to our field, but if, uh, has anyone seen the movie Ip Man? 
It's not actually IP man. I know like we want to call it like IP man. It's actually Ip man, uh, who is an actual figure in, in Chinese martial arts history. Um, and in the movie, he has many friendly battles with masters. Masters would spend time learning their craft, perfecting their style of martial arts. Everyone had a slightly different style. And they would issue friendly challenges because, like, how do you know if it works if you're not testing it? But you don't want to test it and potentially die by, like, becoming Batman or just picking fights with random people. So the masters would have friendly duels between themselves. And... They wouldn't hurt each other, but they had enough skill to test each other's skills without really hurting each other. You see that in the movie. The way that Donnie Yen fights when he's challenging the master is very, very different when the political climate completely changed uh, in, uh, in China at that time. The Japanese took over, and now he's fighting for rice to feed his family. Wow, does his style change, like broken bones and people crying on the floor versus that friendly battle. Um, so it all comes down to realistic uh, training. And of course, you know, Bruce Lee always said the, the board doesn't hit back. Uh, and so this was a, a particularly popular form of more realistic training. Now, in our, in our world, you have to challenge yourself to get some realistic training. This means when you go take a training class, you have to say, well, I don't have enough skill to do that. Okay, you're, you're not going to die. You're not hacking for rice to feed your family. You should challenge yourself a little beyond your skill level when you take certain courses. Of course, SANS and offensive security are some examples there. I'm sure there are others you could point to as well. Uh, the one I really wanted to come to was hacking challenges because I got a chance to catch up with Ed Scotus and Josh Wright um, who, uh, Ed is the one that founded this counter hack challenges. All of them are available for free. Okay. So remember a couple of points from this slide. Every single previous challenge is available for free. Ed and Josh are extremely passionate about this project. They're two of the smartest people that I know, uh, in the world. And they work together to create new challenges every year. All of the answers are there as well. This is a completely free, easy, an awesome way to train yourself. And there's a new one every year. And the entire archive is out there together. So make sure you go check those out at counterhackchallenges.com. Okay. Episode two, security and kung fu tactics. How come I'm the only one that laughs at this picture? Like, I think that's hilarious. It's just Dolph London practicing kung fu at the beat. Okay. Next slide. Number five. If you're in a restaurant, there's a 100% chance that there will be a fight scene. Those of you that have watched kung fu movies know when they go sit down and they're about to eat. I don't know when people eat. All I know is that inside of a restaurant, they sit down and inevitably there's a chopstick flying. There's a bench flying. There's someone jumping from the second balcony down to the first floor balcony, crashing through a table, and a fight ensues. And it's totally awesome because when you're watching a kung fu movie and you're like, oh, you can just get to the fight scene and they walk into a restaurant and you're like, woohoo, fight scene, yeah! Um, if you're on the internet, you're going to be hacked. Similar to the how you're in a restaurant, a kung fu movie, there's going to be a fight scene. You will be hacked. And one of the things when I first uh, started in this industry was I actually worked for a lottery company and we were very focused on looking for threats, on looking for attacks, and looking for vulnererabilities. And we thought, and I still think to this day with the experience I had, we did a really good job at looking for threats, attacks, and vulnerabilities. And we thought, well, we're doing a great job with security. Like, it'd be pretty hard to break into our organization. I, I think about that today, and someone's going to get in. And unless you're looking for them already, you don't know if you've been hacked. And that's why a lot of more focus, I think in the past year, we've had a, a great focus on improving threat hunting, on flipping the tables from looking for the threat or looking for the vulnerability or looking for the exploit. We're looking for something that's already been compromised. You can do a lot of that for free, and I'll talk about more free resources. Uh, Bro IDS, uh, Rita is an open source tool that you may have seen John Strand demonstrating at our uh, table over there. 
there's an open source GitHub repository that was published by Squirrel that is an archive of probably over 100 articles on open source threat hunting techniques. Um, there's also a great uh, threat intelligence GitHub repository with tons of resources on it um, that you can use to do some kind of open source threat hunting. Uh, I, I was going to go through something else, but I, I don't know if we'll have time. So you'll just have to... I, I have what I call... You can find me afterwards and I'll explain it and run it by you. Uh, maybe over some drinks and cigars. I have what's called Paul's Enchanted Quadrants. They're enchanted. They're not the other kind of, they're enchanted quadrants. Uh, so, number six. Uh, if you rush your ass kicked, uh, if you rush your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you rush your training, you will get your ass kicked 100% of the time. In the movie Clan of the White Lotus from 1980, how many people have seen this movie? Get out. You guys are, you're either lying or you're awesome. Uh, so it's a fantastic movie. Gordon Liu fights Pai Mei uh, like three times until he finally wins because he rushed his training. He's like, yes, I'm ready to fight. And then he gets his ass kicked and he goes back and finally he has to learn. Does anyone know what style of Kung Fu he had to learn to defeat Pai Mei? See, I told you you didn't really watch the movie. It's acupuncture Kung Fu, right? It's awesome. Um, so uh, don't rush and learn by doing. Um, I think a lot of us are kind of frustrated by this point. Uh, you know, I, I think that when some of the older people in this field, uh, where there really weren't security related jobs, 100% security related jobs, it wasn't a role. So we started out by doing the help desk, by being sysadmins, by being network professionals. I think that makes for a much more qualified and much better security professional. And I want to encourage the youth of today to do that, uh, so much so that when we uh, interview, uh, we still have open positions at Security Weekly, some of those are interns that work for me. And I asked them, like, well, what do you want to do? And they're like, oh, I want to do security. I'm like, okay, so do you know how to like use Linux and networking and, and programming? They're like, no, I don't know any of those things, but I, I can like look at these alerts that come up and, and, and flag them and stuff. I'm like, no, 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 no. I only take on the ones that are like, I, I want to learn all that stuff first. I'm like, yes, that is the right answer, and they will get the internship with me. So make sure we push for that. Also, proper training. Now, it's interesting in martial arts, you don't want to do training without the proper instruction uh, of someone who knows what the hell they're doing. In other words, in martial arts, there's these really weird things like iron palm training is actually a thing that you can actually do, which is awesome, until you realize that it's like just banging your palm on a bag of rice over and over again. Uh, and that's you, what, on the surface, it might look like what it is, but then there's special oils and a special technique and the supervision of an instructor to make sure that you're doing that properly and not hurting yourself. The same thing with proper training. We need to make sure that as people come into our field, that we help them have a plan. We help them build a lab. We help them sign up for free or low cost training so they can get very specific training. We make sure they practice every day. We get them a mentor to oversee this process and not just go, oh yeah, I'm going to go like create a lab. Like, no, 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 follow the process first. Okay, number seven. There is always someone more skilled than you, uh, which is awesome. In this movie example, Michelle Yeoh, does anyone know what other movie Michelle Yeoh is that was very, very famous? Yeah, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, right? Um, so uh, she is dressed as a man in this movie, Wing Chun, and she kicks everyone's ass. It's awesome. She is the most talented martial artist inside of the whole movie. It's friggin' great. Um, and when we look at uh, security, we know that some of the attackers might be more skilled than you. I, I don't think we often dwell on this point when we're looking inside of our networks, but they may be more skilled than you are, especially in certain areas. Uh, others in the security community might be more skilled. Don't, if you are the more skilled person, don't poke fun at someone who's not skilled enough. It comes down to when I talk to people in our field that have led really large projects uh, such as Mike Kershaw and H.D. Moore and Fyodor, and I asked them about how they embrace their community. 
They're like, look, Paul, the basic rule is don't be a dick. And I'm like, yeah, that's a great rule to live. So we should all embrace that message, right? Help those that are less skilled than us and don't poke fun at them. Okay, number eight. The weapon you choose matters little as it takes skill to win. And I think this is very, very applicable to our field. I mean, unless you allow Carl Leung, who is a lineage holder for Hungar Kung Fu and a very, very famous on-screen and off-screen martial artist. Uh, does anyone know who his student and godson was? Who appeared on a previous slide? Eh. Gordon Liu. Um, so, uh, he was one, uh, uh, he's, it's a big deal. He was teaching Kung Fu at five years old. He can pick up any weapon and just be awesome with it. Um, he's since passed away, but he's certainly one of my heroes in the martial arts world and produced some of the, like, greatest movies uh, ever. But, <laughs> now, I, I don't really think I need to say anything in the slides. It's kind of self-explanatory, right? <laughs> so, uh, one of the things I do want to say that I think is applicable um, was in the eight diagram, uh, pole fighter, uh, in order for Gordon Liu to graduate from a shell in training, he has to beat one of the more senior monks in a fight. And every single time Gordon gets his ass kicked and then he goes back and he fabricates his own weapon, which is a three section staff, which is really awesome. I should really have one for this talk because I can actually throw one without hitting myself too many times. I'm sorry, 36 Chambers of Shaolin, you are correct. Thank you, A, for the day. I have a wonderful beverage for you for helping me out. Uh, so uh, he built his own tool to win in the 36 Chambers of Shaolin. Thank you very much. We'll talk about A Diagram Pole Fighter later, A, for the day. Um, but I think when a lot of us sit down to build our own tools or have our own project, right, we try and think of something completely new. Now, in the movie, they make it seem like Gordon was the first one ever to create a three-section staff. Uh, he wasn't. There's a whole other story about that. But I think a lot of us do it in the security. I'm like, wow, someone's already done that or someone's done something similar. Screw that. Just do it. Like for fun, I wrote a port scanner in C. Sure, there's tons of port scanners that are out there today. But I learned a lot right in my own. I made it special purpose for me, right? Um, I wrote a honey port script in Python. There's tons of honey pot and honey port script stuff out there. But I, I wrote one for fun. Um, I wrote a DNS blacklist in, in Bash just because, like, it was there, right? I mean, and then Joff did a, a lot more, like, better work on that. So I was like, oh, I can do that better. I'm like, well, that's cool. I learned a lot doing what I did. So don't worry about being too unique. Um, tools never beat experience and training. Uh, bitch, really quick on this one. Like, basically, if you've got a good process, you've got good people, and you've got good technology you are going to win versus any one of those things individually. So process people and technology wins. This is the chess example where they had uh, chess players. They weren't the best chess players in the world, but they had a good process. They had good technology. And lo and behold, they can beat some of the best computers and people in the world who play chess. So that's, anyway. Okay, number nine, because we're probably running short on time. Number nine. The best defense is always to have a good offense. And now, I'm not saying we should all hack back, right? But there are certainly lots of deception technologies and things that we can do today. Did anyone see the movie with Jet Li called The One? Yeah, that was like a pretty bad movie, like, like plot-wise. But one of the subtleties in that movie that maybe not everyone recognizes or realizes is there was two forms of Jet Li. There was the good Jet Li and the bad Jet Li. And the good Jet Li used Bagua, which is a style of Kung Fu that's very circular, right? It's the eight diagram. You see people walking in circles a lot, uh, practicing Bagua. And it's a very soft style of Kung Fu. Jing Yixuan, which is what the bad Jet Li practice, is also uh, actually a soft style, uh, internal style of Kung Fu. But we say that they break through the wall. In Jing Yi, Every block is also a strike. As you're blocking, you're striking, uh, which is awesome when you're first learning sparring, getting your ass kicked. To incorporate something like that is super helpful. Uh, 
Uh, so in the same respect, I think a lot of our technology today is kind of embracing that uh, blocking technology and getting better at it. And I, I don't want to plug a whole lot of vendors, but I, this vendor, Signal Sciences, happens to be a sponsor. They happen to be one of the examples that I use. There's lots of examples out there. There's Immunio. There's tons of vendors in the deception space. There's tons of vendors in the web app space. But one that I did speak with last week told me, and this is a very reliable resource, Zane Lackey, he was also on the Breaking Security podcast, as well as our podcast, as well as an upcoming webcast that we have. Um, these folks are legit. He said 90% of their customers are running in Blockbone, which I think is really cool uh, and something we need to embrace as an industry because we can't just sit back without blocking stuff. Okay, number 10. The softer styles of Kung Fu always lead to victory. Did anyone see Tai Chi Master with Jet Li? Show of hands. Show of hands. See, a lot, a lot less hands, huh? You guys got to get up on your Tai Chi Master. It's a friggin' awesome movie. Uh, if you want to see one of Jet Li's fantastic and most impressive acting, uh, he goes crazy in this movie. He's so distraught that his friend has turned on him that he actually goes batshit insane. It's hilarious to watch. Uh, and then has this realization that if he does Tai Chi and incorporates it with his style, he can beat his friend and, and save his friends and, and save the world, which is great. The softer side of security is also very powerful as well. Communicating risk to administrators and management is one of those softer styles that we all need to incorporate into our uh, daily regimen. So here are how vulnerabilities are really fixed. Um, the the bluish purple here is representing working as a team. Um, your vulnerability management program is in red. Your patch management program is in orange. And this little, little tiny green slice is Bob the IT guy working by himself. So working as a team is important, especially in incident response where you have to communicate with a lot of different teams and communicate those three points in the beginning, what information is important, what systems are important, and communicate that out to your incident response team. Okay, uh, I think uh, Josh Coleman was here, I think he was presenting, probably talking about this stuff. He can talk about it way better than I can, but Josh does a lot more, and people like Josh, like Katie Mazuris, are doing a lot more softer skills to implement security, which is great. Okay, you don't need expensive tools to win. You can fight with what is around you, and they do this in the Kung Fu movies all the time. Most often it's a bench, because those are like everywhere. Apparently back in the day in China, benches were like everywhere. Like everyone needed some places to sit down, so they needed benches. Uh, in your own networks, you don't need expensive tools. In fact, I did, I don't know why, but I decided to do an entire talk on this. It'll be uh, given in InfoSec world. Uh, it'll be how to defend your enterprise using open source tools. So if anyone has input on that, like I need help with that, <laughs> please help me. Send me some email. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. So political and social. Number 11. The bad guys are always in cahoots with the government, right? With state-sponsored hacking. I'm just going to quickly go through that one. Like we all know about state-sponsored hacking and ties to the government. So we can do that. Number 12. The protagonist wants to learn Kung Fu to, of course, fundamental plotline in every Kung Fu movie is take revenge. Of course, in our industry, probably a really bad idea. Revenge hacking is bad. Uh, it probably... Like, Um, the original was King I'm Hi folks, I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, I think the microphone was having battery problems or something, and we lost audio from here on out. Sorry about the inconvenience.